take it away. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the 59th virtual shadowing session. Uh, tonight's session is actually going to be a PA spotlight in acute care, general, and trauma surgery. Uh, and we are jo joined tonight by Pre uh, Brina. She is a physician assistant here with us. Um, so as always, uh, you may contact us through Instagram at virtual shadowing or YouTube or our website, virtualshadowing.com. Uh, and then next slide, please. Uh, this is the virtual shadowing working group. We have Reagan, myself, Cheyenne, Taylor, Ali, Rachel, Maryam, Alana, Rohit, Kiana, Aditya, and Ani Ruth. Um, and then of course we have our physician faculty directors, Dr. Fowler, Dr. Morchetti, Dr. Salazar, and Dr. Reno. And next slide, please. Okay, so these are the upcoming sessions for July. Uh, July 13th, next week, we have a specialty spotlight in general surgery. Uh, and just a heads up, uh, we might not be starting that session at 8 p.m. So just keep an eye out uh, for announcements on Instagram or email um, or our website. So just make sure that you're aware of that. Uh, July 20th, we have a DO spotlight uh, in Air Force Family Medicine. The 23rd is Technology and Medicine, uh, Robotic Surgery. And the 27th is a specialty spotlight in Cardiology. Uh, so join us on Zoom or YouTube Live at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. And we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, and then as always, we also have two question and answer sessions uh, throughout this presentation. So there's gonna be one in the middle and one at the very end of the presentation. So keep typing your questions in the chat as we go along and we will do our best to get to them. Uh, and before we introduce our speaker tonight, I will hand it off to Dr. Fowler for an announcement. Well, hey everybody. So nice to have you all here from all over the world. It's uh, terrific. Uh, we're still here a month and a, uh, a year and a month later. Um, and uh, our plan, if you keep coming back and if you want us to do this is that we will keep putting these programs on. Um, a bunch of our group is moving off to medical school and uh, others are coming on to be with us. And so our plan is to keep going. If you let us know you, that, that you want us to keep doing this because we're doing it for you. The admissions committee season at my university is starting very soon. And um, it's going to be interesting this year to see how closely admission committees track virtual shadowing hours. So each week we'll keep you posted on uh, what we think uh, are uh, the, or, or is the credence that uh, admission committees give. But the indication we have so far looks pretty good. One of our previous speakers spoke, Dr. Morales from Texas Tech spoke about the fact that uh, they want 200 hours and however, that those, however those hours are accumulated, such as online shadowing is fine with them. Uh, I know that with my own university, I intend to try to carry on that same kind of uh, legacy here. So anyway, it's good to have you all. Uh, it's, it's an, it means a lot to us each week to have you keep coming back, all 230 of you now. Uh, I know you want to wish well to um, uh, several of our members of the working group who go off to medical school next week. So please wish them well. And uh, uh, with that, uh, Cheyenne, I think we have a very special guest this evening. Would you introduce her? <laughs> yes, absolutely. So tonight we are joined by Brina. Uh, she is an acute care general and trauma surgery physician assistant based in Vancouver, Washington. And we are so excited to have her here tonight with us to explain her experiences. And so I will let her uh, take it away and get this night going. All right. Hi, you guys. My name is Brina, as introduced. Um, I am a surgical PA. I kind of do a little bit of everything in my position. Um, I love helping you guys out and doing this virtual shadowing thing. This is probably my fourth or fifth time doing it with different groups. So, uh, let me know at any time if you have questions, uh, we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. So I, just a little bit about me outside of working in healthcare because there is more to you than working in healthcare. Um, I love to travel. So I've probably traveled to, I don't know, maybe 17 different countries. Um, it's a big part of why I wanted to be a PA and my work-life balance. Um, I love hiking, backpacking, cycling, indoor, outdoor cycling. Uh, I do CrossFit every morning, usually when I'm good on my schedule. 
uh, skiing, and I really love pre-PA, PA school mentoring, answering questions for anyone. Um, this picture was taken, as you can see, the summer after didactic year of my PA school. So we had a summer break, and I this is the top of South Sister uh, in Bend, Oregon. So sunrise hike, hiked in the dark. It was great. All right. So as some of you know, a PA, uh, right now we are called physician assistants. The AAPA just signed a bill, I think, I think it was a month ago, pretty close to a month ago now, maybe a little longer, that officially changed the titles to a uh, physician associate. So that's going to take a couple of years, I imagine, to really roll out and do, um, you know, until everything's officially changed. But that's huge for I think the PA profession, um, there's been lots of debate over the last couple of years since I was in school about the name change or what we should change it to. There was all sorts of different names that came through, but physician associate kind of became the, the one that really held true to what we do and held true to um, what most people wanted. I think that as a physician assistant, oftentimes, people get confused with you as a medical assistant, which there's nothing wrong with being a medical assistant. Obviously, it's just that we're very different roles in what we do and our capabilities. Um, the other thing that is interesting is when you are trans, when medical assistant or physician assistant is translated to say Spanish per se, it is translated in the same way. So a lot of times when you're working with interpreters, that can get confusing for the patient because they don't really know what your role is. So a lot of our job as physician assistants and now associates is to talk about, is to educate our patients and what we can do, what we can't do, our medical training, how we are not medical doctors, but our prescribing abilities, our, our, um, our I guess, education and how that um, plays in and how we can support the doctors. Um, the other word, you know, Brina, that... I, I, Brina, Brina, I think it's long overdue. Uh, I actually went to school with PA students. We, it was PA students, nursing students, and the med students. We went to school where I, back in Georgia, where I came from, for the first year together, so oh, that wow. we could, so that we could create the team approach from the ground up. Which you know, it's a pretty good idea. Um, yeah. I think I think the name change is long overdue because you're not an assistant. We we jointly work together to better the human condition through the consideration of the creation of a differential diagnosis. We do it as partners. And so I, I welcome that name change. Awesome. Yeah. And it's, it's really good to hear support from, from medical doctors and nursing and, and just from different aspects and part of healthcare, because the PA profession is so new in regards to doctors and nursing. So we don't have as big of a background and we don't have, um, a lot of people don't know what we are and what we do. And so the more education we can provide for the, for the patients and also just in, as well as other providers, because, um, like the hospital I work at, there's only two PAs in the entire hospital. So a lot of people have never worked with PAs that closely. So it just requires a lot of education and, and um, improvement in our in our profession. So I'm really excited about the name change. A lot of people are excited about it. It'll take a little while to kind of start rolling, but I had to throw that slide in here for it because it's just kind of new, exciting stuff for us. Um, another another thing you'll hear us called is APP, so advanced practice providers or practitioners, um, mid level providers. That's kind of getting away from that. People don't like that one as much. Um, and then just make sure we're not calling us physician's assistant because that's like a big no-no, especially in application. So enough on my rant on that. I kind of talked about that here. So what can a PA do? So a PA can, usually the schooling is about 26 months. Um, we usually have to have a uh, amount of hours, like healthcare experience hours, and it's quite a bit of hours. So um, it's one of those things where you're taking a couple years after undergraduate degrees and you're working as an EMT, a scribe, a physical therapy aide, um, a CNA. Some people are nursing. There's like a lot of different options. 
Um, we had a lot of military folk in our uh, program, but it all kind of in, ends up getting us to the point where we can order and interpret labs. So I every day order my own labs, order my own imaging, look at those values, decide what I want to do with them, diagnose patients, assess them, create plans for them. Um, I go and examine them, obviously. I see what kind of physical exam findings they have and see what I want to do and what kind of plan I want to create with that person. And then um, we don't need, I think a misconception with a PA is that there's a supervising physician that's kind of following around and hovering over you the whole time, which is absolutely not the point of a PA. Like our job is to help, uh, like Dr. Fowler said, our job is to help make everyone's job easier and to create kind of a group approach to medicine. So there's many times where I'm doing something completely different. I'm helping discharge a patient and working on all these different um, areas that need to be completed so that this patient can be discharged safely to a skilled nursing facility. So how are they getting transported there? I need to work with the care management team. How are they getting follow-up appointments? So someone has to do that and a provider has to sign off on that. And so I do a lot of that kind of logistical stuff, which I love doing. So that's something I'm really interested in. I pride myself in kind of creating that, that plan, that discharge for plan for patients. Wait, Sabrina, wait a minute. You mean you don't just go in the OR and take care of patients. You mean you have to coordinate with all these people <laughs> for, for aftercare and social <laughs> services. You have to do all that stuff. Uh, yeah, they don't, they don't tell you that in school, man. No, they, I think no, right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and, and honestly, it's funny you say that, because honestly, it's one of the things that's the most confusing when you first start is you're kind of like, wait, I thought this, somebody is going to tell me where this patient's supposed to go. Oh, I'm supposed to tell you where this patient's supposed to go. Oh, okay. Well, how do I know where the patient's supposed to go? <laughs> <laughs> last, last year, in the calendar year last year, I did about 100 interviews. I did uh, 50 with the admissions committee, 25 for new faculty for our emergency department at UT, mm -hmm. and about 25 for new residents that being interviewed to come. We had 1,600, almost 1,700 applicants for 22 spots. And um, one, of, one of the applicants interviewed me instead and <laughs> said, well, about Parkland Hospital, what would you fix? Give me two things that you would fix about Parkland. I said, I'll tell you exactly what those are, is that I would be able to hand somebody a clinic appointment and they could absolutely, without <laughs> any question about their financing or anything. Make it to that, that you, appointment. You go, you, go, you go to ophthalmology clinic at 2 p.m. on Wednesday afternoon. They will be expecting you regardless of ability to pay. And then the other thing would be that I could hand them their prescriptions and they could uh, and they could absolutely have exact everything that I needed them to have, you know. The, yeah, the problem is we, we have an, an imperfect system, unfortunately. But please go ahead. I, I don't mean to walk. Oh. Here. <laughs> no, absolutely. It's, it's something that I've learned over the last little while. That's one of the most frustrating things about healthcare, but also something where if you don't pay attention, people get lost and fall through the cracks and so it's your job as a provider and as a team to make sure that you can do everything they can so they don't fall through the cracks. Um, I guess moving on, kind of chatting with the, the supervising physician. So most, require, most states require PAs to have sponsoring or supervising physicians that generally that's kind of like your your provider has to be a phone call away. They don't have to be hovering over you. They don't have to be in the building. Um, it's state by state difference. However, I know of two states, there might be more, but the two that I've heard of, I think it's Oregon and Utah, who have now abolished that supervising physician requirement. Um, Utah still requires, like if you're a new grad for so many hours, you have to have some sort of supervision. And then I don't know exactly the details on Oregon, but that's super exciting because as a PA, so NPs and PAs are basically this advanced practice provider level of, of a practitioner and NPs do not have in most states a supervising physician requirement. And so it makes hiring PAs a little bit more difficult and can kind of be a barrier for hiring PAs, even though you think they're 
extremely qualified. It's like basically the hospital system is like, hey, this person's way more um, difficult to hire. We have to have a supervising physician. It's more costly. So we only want NPs. So that's a huge, another huge advancement in the last little while that's going to um, really make the PA profession just that much better and create that much more access for, for patients and for soon to be providers and providers like myself. So really excited about all the stuff that's happening and changing and um, all the states are a little bit different, which does make it a little complicated, but in general, you know, one follows and kind of the other goes. I'm hoping Washington is soon. All right. Uh oh, this is in my way. I can't see my writing. Um, okay, so unique aspects of being a PA. So I kind of touched on this a little bit, but basically uh, being a PA requires or allows you to basically work in any specialty that you want to work in. And you can change specialties without having to do further, basically like residency or fellowship. So um, that's something that's super important to me. And a lot of the reason why I chose being a PA over going to med school was because I, I was like, hey, I'm young. I got a lot of years to work. And there's a chance I might get sick of working in one specialty for 40 years. So I really thought about the fact of being able to laterally switch and learn. The best thing about medicine is it's constantly, you know, it's constantly changing. You're constantly having to up your skills. You're ever learning. You're never going to know everything. So um, no matter what route you, cho you choose, you're going to always be learning. So for me, it was just the ability to kind of change into a different specialty if wanted to. So that's really, really cool. And one of the best things about being a PA, um, we, our goal as PAs is really to improve access to healthcare for patients. Um, it's obviously a little bit cheaper to hire a PA than a doctor in some rural cases. And so um, sometimes we can just kind of be that bridge to a larger facility, or we can um, just kind of be that physician extension that um, this, you know, this doctor can take care of multiple hospitals and hey, this PA, you got a PA at each location. So it really, it just, it creates a bigger net and it helps uh, this imperfect system try to create a little bit more access for people that really don't have it. And we talk about this like lack of access to care a lot. Um, it's kind of beat in your head a little bit, but you don't really realize how real it is until you work into you work in a situation where like Dr. Fowler was saying, like, I have patients that I literally cannot get to clinic because they don't have a ride. They have no family members. They're homeless. They got sent to a skilled nursing facility that, you know, 40, 50 miles away. And there's no transportation. Like there's literally nothing. Like, how can there be nothing? And there is nothing. Like it's so frustrating. Um, so just a lot of that is just working to get an um, imperfect system more perfect, I guess. Um, and then the other thing that I really love about being a PA is I get to work with a ton of different specialties all the time. I think that really happens with basically anybody in healthcare. But as a PA, I work really close, closely with the nurses, um, with the care managers, with social work, with like I'm kind of that liaison between everyone kind of creating and uh, a plan. And I love that about what I do. Um, I work in surgery. So a lot of times the surgeons don't have time to do that kind of stuff. And so they, they rely on me to basically make sure that everything is being done right that needs to be done. And they trust me to do that because they trust me as a provider. So a lot of it's just creating a good relationship with your, with your physician and the other people that you work with. All right, so a little bit about the pre-PA path. Um, this is a little different for everyone and it's changing a lot and especially with COVID. So I didn't go to school. I went to school before COVID obviously. So um, a little bit of this has changed just with like virtual shadowing and shadowing and volunteer hours. But um, when people ask me what the most important thing, so there's some musts. So you gotta have a good, GPA or a competitive GPA. It doesn't have to be a 4.0. 
but you have to be competitive. You have to care about your schooling and it's important to know that base knowledge for medicine. Um, for PA school, you now have to have a bachelor's degree. For a while, there was a bachelor's degree option, but I think that's all completely gone away and now it's a master's program. So you have to have a bachelor's. Your bachelor's can be in anything. It could be in music, as long as you have the prerequisites for your PA program that you're applying to. Um, there's healthcare shadowing, healthcare hours, shadowing hours, patient care experience, volunteer work. So when people ask me like, what's the most important thing or what's the one thing that you, you tell pre-PA students to get before they go, they apply to PA school and I tell them volunteer hours because for, for volunteer hours, it shows that you're not just doing the very bare minimum, you're doing something because you're interested in it. You're going out of your way because you're passionate about something that has to do with, it doesn't even actually have to be in medicine. Honestly, your volunteer work could be in something unrelated, but if it's something you're passionate about, that shows that shows people that you, you have a care for others, that you're willing to give up your time to do something that's bigger than yourself. And I think that's what medicine is all about is, being bigger than yourself and working with a group and knowing how to work with a team. So that's like my one piece of advice. Um, I don't know if it's really that good advice, but I think it is. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so this is kind of just like the base. Every PA school is different, which is also one of the most frustrating things. It's not like a blanket statement. Some, some PA schools are like, you need 5,000 healthcare hours. Some places are like, you need 1,000 healthcare hours. So you kind of just have to do your research. There's a lot of new um, uh, like websites that help you kind of decipher that. I didn't have those when I applied to PA school. So I don't know them that well, but I think there are a lot. Okay, so my path to PA school, I got a bachelor's in kinesiology uh, and a minor in Spanish. So I, um, played collegiate soccer while I was doing my undergrad. So I didn't have any time to do any like other work hours. Um, a lot of people during their undergraduate, like get their CNA license or EMT or something, which is really helpful for them. I didn't have, I didn't have time to do that when I was playing soccer. I don't regret it at all. I loved what I did. I loved my college experience. Everyone's path is a little different. Um, after I graduated, I knew I always wanted to work in medicine. I had a big debate whether I wanted to uh, go to med school, PA school. So I kind of took a couple years. And if you're going to PA school, you do need some healthcare hours. So you basically need to take what gap years. Um, so I worked as a physical therapy aide for a year. I loved working in physical therapy, but I just felt like it wasn't enough of that diagnosis, kind of assessment plan creating, really getting down to like the nitty gritty of what's going on kind of on a physiological basis. Um, so that just, that wasn't for me, but I loved my work there, met a lot of great people. Um, then I transitioned to a scribe job. So I worked for a scribe, as a scribe for a family medicine PA for three months. And then I transitioned to being a chief scribe where I managed a bunch of other scribes and trained them. And I worked in internal medicine, family medicine, a little bit of PEDS, sports med, and a little bit of OB, um, basically just like filling in where needed. And that was when I really feel like I got to understand a lot about what PAs could do versus what doctors could do versus what NPs could do and kind of figure out like the different specialties of how PAs are different in every specialty. So I scribed for both a family medicine doctor and PA, which was really great, um, learned a ton. It was absolutely a blast. And I then also scribed for like an ortho for a little while. And you can just see how different every specialty is and how different like your schedules are or um, the knowledge base or their interactions with their physicians or their surgeons. Um, so yeah, it was great. So I always recommend scribing to anyone who feels like they need a little bit more exposure to 
what they want to do in the future or if they don't know like I oh I, I think it is a cool job but is it really for me like what do they really do on a day-to-day -day basis as a scribe you're literally their little shadow following them around doing everything they're doing so you get to see how they talk to patients um the procedures they do everything so it's great uh highly recommend and then while I was a scribe in a and um, I think, I can't remember when I did my, I had to take some additional prerequisite courses because uh, the way that they were named in my undergrad didn't count for PA school, which was lame. And then volunteering. So throughout my undergrad, I volunteered for um, this place called Top Soccer. So it was uh, basically a soccer for children with mental and physical disabilities and just creating an atmosphere for them. And then I also volunteered for the Brian Grant Foundation, which is a foundation that helps um, patients living with Parkinson's disease and creating exercise plans and um, just kind of awareness of the disease. So I did that and I still am involved with uh, the Brian Grant Foundation here and there, not as much as I was before, but yeah, it's been, Great and volunteering, like I said, super important and very beneficial. All right, so here's me in PA school. And I went to the University of Washington in Seattle. I graduated in 2019. Uh, the program is a 26 month program. At the time, they were offering a bachelor's level uh, PA, like they used to offer bachelor's levels, and they were just phasing it out. So I think either the 2019, I think the 2019 year was the last year. Um, I got my master's and uh, 52 students were enrolled in Seattle and 50 of them graduated. Uh, the University of Washington, the Medex program is a program that has multiple PA sites. So they have a Tacoma site, a Seattle site, Spokane. Uh, they now have one in Hawaii and out Anchorage, Alaska. And I think I heard a rumor they're maybe making one in Nevada. So it's the second oldest program in the country after Duke. So very well known, um, long history of producing PA. So they're all over the place. Uh, this is me and loving my life in PA school. My first suture is here. Um, my sutures look a lot better now. Don't worry. Um, and then the age range. So Medex is known for kind of the, um, the not the average kind of medical PA student applicant. So our average, our age range was 25 to 55. I was definitely, if not the youngest, one of the younger people in the class. But we also had about five or six people that were in their 50s. And that was our second career. We had occupational therapists, we had medic, uh, military folk, we had EMTs, paramedics, um, physical therapists, like the whole gamut. So lots of really awesome people and got to learn a lot of really cool stuff from people who had been working already for most of their life and had so much education and background that will help them be amazing, amazing practitioners. All right, PA school continued. So PA school, is different everywhere you go. And obviously now with COVID, I don't know exactly how they're doing all of the classes, but when I was there, mandatory class from 8.30 in the morning to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. So it doesn't leave you a lot of time for studying. Imagine that. Um, so yeah, we basically, I don't know when you find time to study, but we all do it. So we're in class from 8.30 to 4. We have like an hour and a half lunch break. Some people worked out during that time. Some people studied. Some people cried in the corner. Like I did it all. Um, after everyone's schedules a little differently. So this is like something I'm really passionate about uh, in medicine is just making sure that you don't give up your whole life. One in school and two, once you start working, like I I'm really passionate about creating a balance that works for you and allows you to be the best practitioner that you can be. So for me, I would, every day I woke up at six o'clock, three days out of that week, I would go to the gym in the morning. And then two days out of that week, I would get up and study early. 
Um, I stayed after school every single day until probably like 7.30 to study. And I studied every Saturday and most Sundays. Some people didn't study at all on the weekends and they stayed late during the week. Some people gave up their workout routines. Um, everyone's a little different. I was very adamant about not giving up my workout routine because it's something that keeps me sane, keeps me healthy, keeps my brain working. So I just told myself it's, it's a non-negotiable. Um, at the time, my now husband was living in Vancouver and I was living in Seattle. So we did a long distance relationship for two and a half years or whatever, two plus years um, during my time in Seattle and then also during clinical rotation. So I, I get a lot of questions about relationships in PA school. And so I'm always happy to answer and help you guys with any, I guess, information I can give about long distance relationships and working through that because it's not easy, but it's definitely doable. Um, and then the PANTS, which is the PA certifying exam, I took that like a psychopath two weeks after uh, I graduated PA school and the same week that I was getting married. So <laughs> that was fun, but I passed and got done. And then I was like, all right, we're going on our honeymoon. Um, and then you have to take the PANRI, which is the PA recertified certification exam every 10 years. Um, and then about 100 hours of CME every two years. So that's actually 100 hours isn't too difficult with all the certifications yet, like BLS, ACLS, I take ATLS. Um, there's tons of opportunities for education and healthcare. So it sounds like a lot, but you do so much learning all the time that I don't know. It kind of gives you an excuse to sometimes take classes that you're like, I just want to take this. So this has nothing to do with what I'm doing or it's not required, but I want to take it because I want to learn it. All right. So this is my schedule. Um, I work 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. I work 10 hour days, 4 10, um, generally Monday through Thursday. I don't take call. I don't work weekends. And I work with one other PA. My schedule is very, very, very cush. It won't be like that forever. Um, we'll probably have to start taking call and work on the weekends in the next little while. Our, our team is just going through some changes right now. And so we're hiring a bunch of new people and trying to figure out how that's going to work with the scheduling. But I love my schedule. Like I said, um, having a balance is really important to me and really important to taking care of my patients. So um and I like to see my husband because I like him. So when we get to hang out, that's pretty cool too. <laughs> All right. So this is what my day looks like uh, most days. So I wake up at 4.30 in the morning and I go to the gym from 5 to 6. I commute from 6 to 7, get ready, eat my breakfast in the car. And I start rounding at 7 a.m. Uh, Rounding is very variable based on the amount of patients you have on your service. So um, before, when I was in PA school, I think this, I don't know why I think it's funny, but when I was in PA school, people would talk about rounding, like your teachers be like, oh, we're going to go rounding. And I'm like, what the heck does rounding mean? I'd never worked in a hospital. All of my pre-healthcare experience was in outpatient. So I literally had no idea what rounding was. And I was too scared to ask. I didn't want to sound like a ding dong. So I just basically like did my own research to figure it out. And then when I finally went to clinicals, I was like, oh, I get it now. This makes sense. <laughs> so basically rounding. So every, every service, so I'm the surgery service. So we have a list of patients that we're supposed to see every day. Um, surgery, trauma, anyone that's on our list is our service. And rounding just means you go around and see those patients in the morning. So this duration vastly depends on how many people are on the service. So our service ranges from four people to 21 people. So it, it really just depends, um, depends on the time of year. And we do rounding a little differently. So basically myself and generally there's two PAs on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then uh, one PA on Monday or Friday, and then there's one surgeon. So generally, I would say most hospitals round as a group. So the residents, the 
PAs, a lot of nurses, social work, doctors, they all try to round as a big group and go to see all the patients. We don't do that. We basically like split the list. I start from one floor and the surgeon starts from the other floor. And if the other PA is there, he starts from a different floor and we just kind of see the patients that we see. Um, obviously, if we have questions, we talk to the surgeon or if there's something that we're like, hey, I don't really know what the plan is. Or if that changes, then we obviously commu communicate about all the patients. Um, but in general, we kind of go see our own patients, do our own thing, make the decisions. Um, it's a little bit faster that way. And because we're kind of an acute care and trauma service, you have to kind of make sure that you see those patients and get all that done early in the day before who knows what's going to happen throughout the day. Um, if it's a slow day, a lot of times we go see the patients multiple times. But if it's a really busy day and we have four or five cases and traumas, and sometimes you just can't do that. But with two or three people, the chances and the likelihood of being able to take care of all of that stuff throughout the day is higher. And then for my specific position, I also, so this is all for the acute care surgery side or and the trauma. That's kind of like one group. And then general surgery. So I just help scrub into general surgery cases. So basically all I do, I get paged when the patient's in the room, sedated, intubated, ready to go, prepped, and they say, hey, we need you, can you come assist? And so I come down, I scrub into the case. Sometimes I do post-op orders. Um, sometimes I do like the brief op note and then go back to what I'm doing on the floor or other surgeries. It really depends on the day, but mostly they um, range from 7 to 3, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then acute care cases can come in any time. So that's kind of like you got appies, you got gallbladders, you got um, perforated diverticulitis, you got all sorts of stuff that is emergent and needs to be taken care of right then and there. And those are the acute care cases. And then obviously consult. So anytime the hospital service or someone else can say, hey, I think I have a surgical need, come see this patient. So I'll go see consult. Um, Discharges can happen all the, at any time. Generally, we try to get them done in the morning, but sometimes it's like a, hey, we'll discharge you in the afternoon kind of thing. Admits and then traumas obviously happen at any time. And then 5 p.m. is a pretty ish time that I go home. Yesterday, I didn't leave till six. Sometimes if there's a big case I need, they need help on, I don't leave till seven, but I would say pretty average, I leave about five. All right, so I just broke down this um this this is like a little bit about what I do so I'm kind of on three different teams that work really really closely together and a lot of the same people work on the same team so um the acute care surgery and trauma is basically one so that's one surgeon on for both of those because I'm at a level three hospital so acute care surgery and trauma that's happening at any time cost like I said any of that happens whenever it happens, there's no way to know. Um, and then trauma is again, happening anytime that can take a very short period of time that can take a really long period of time. There's no way to know. So like I said, trying to get our core of our work done in the morning helps prevent a lot of backlog and pa patients that are frustrated because they hadn't seen a provider all day. And then for the general surgery, I so for the acute care surgery, I do all post-op follow-up. So myself and the other PA, we say we see, I would say 95% of the acute care surgery follow-ups at about two weeks, all the wound care. So we manage like home health, wound care, like home health orders, wound care, vacs, all of that. And then we also, for the general surgery portion of it, we manage like clinic triage. So anyone that calls and needs basically like a same day appointment or needs to be seen whether they need, we do kind of like a courtesy um, if we can get them in to see them so that they don't have to go to the emergency room if they don't need to. Um, I've, I've done a couple direct admits from our clinic of patients that need to be seen same day. And it was just easier to directly admit them from the clinic than have them go to the O or the ER. Um, but that's pretty rare. But um, yeah, that's kind of about what I do. Our hospital does what's called full or modified traumas. Full traumas are basically like full trauma activation. Everybody 
oh, ours there like massive transfusion protocol, like everybody is getting called anesthesia and everyone is in the ED and it's like a big case. The EMS calls, whether it's a full or modified trauma, they can obviously up be upgraded or downgraded based on um, certain criteria and once they get to the ED. And then modified trauma is the ED actually handles themselves and they only consult us if they need to be admitted to the trauma service. So we are considered the trauma service. So a lot of times like a ground level fall and a couple broken rib fractures, they don't need to call like a full trauma so that everyone's down there and using all our resources. Um, the ED manages it and then they consult us for uh, admission and pain control and management. All right, first round of Q&A. All right, so we do have a couple questions here for you. Um, so one of the first questions that we got, um, what makes um, PAs different from a nurse practitioner besides schooling and pathways? Um, well, I think that generally nurse practitioners and PAs, I mean, we're the same, I would consider us the same level of practitioner. Um, I would say the biggest difference is the schooling and the route of how you get there. So a nurse practitioner has to be a nurse first. I think there's some bridge programs where they can go nurse and then they don't even have to practice as a nurse and they can go straight into nurse practitioner. Um, I think the big thing and the history behind the PA profession is the PA profession started as military medics that had a bunch of training in the military and overseas and they were doing a bunch of healthcare and then they got back to civilian world and they weren't able or like they weren't able to do what they were already doing because there was no criteria and there was no, nowhere for them to practice like they weren't doctors but they weren't nurses so there was kind of this like what do we do they have all this training and so like that's the background behind the PA profession is we have a lot of pre pre training training so pre PA school training so everyone that's in a PA school okay take that back not everyone there's now becoming bridge programs from um, I think your undergrad. So that's getting less and less. But um, I would say more or less, it's mostly the training process um, and where you want to end up. I don't see a ton of NPs in surgery, a lot more PAs in surgery. That makes sense. Um, and so another student asked, uh, what is the best job for clinical hours in terms of the PA school application? Um, this is for undergrad. Sorry, can you say that again? Yeah, sure. Uh, so another student asked, what would be, in your opinion, um, one of the best jobs for clinical hours in terms of the PA school application? Um, I'm assuming as an undergraduate student. Oh, um, I think it's really hard. I think if I were to do it over again, I wish I was like an EMT or a paramedic because of the position I work in. I actually have a really close friend that's a paramedic and firefighter. And I asked him if I could basically just roll along with him because I want to know more about the pre health or pre hospital setting. You don't get trained. If you don't, if you don't work in that setting, you don't know anything about it. And for me, based on what I do, I see a lot of trauma emergent cases and I, and I want to know what kind of happens beforehand. So personally, I wish I was an EMT or paramedic. Like I said before, scribing, I think is one of the best ways to get medical knowledge, um, just Rep repetition of medical terminology, understanding and watching how different providers talk to their patients. I think that's something that can't really be taught is understanding really good bedside manner, how patients uh, or how providers explain and have difficult conversations with patients. That's something that you, you have to see and, and see multiple times to really be good at it. Um, but I would for PA school specifically, I would research every school you want to go to and make sure that you're doing what specific things they want, if that's a school you're really interested in. Uh, Brina, this is Fowler. So um, have you had to become reasonably expert in ultrasound? I suspect so. Have you, have you not? Through your trauma we, work? No, actually. So like, it's really interesting. So um I, I haven't done any like uh, fast exam training, but all of the ED doctors are trained in fast exams, but very, I mean, the surgeons are, but the surgeons use it less than the ED doctors. 
So I've just noticed that throughout my training is generally like the surgical team uses it less, the emergency room uses it more. I've never been trained in it, but it is something that I is on my like plans to be trained in. Thank you. Um, so another uh, question that one of the students asked is, are there programs that are specialty based um, in, in, I guess, PA school? And if so, is it important to decide our preferred field of practice before we apply to the program? Or does every program cover about the same materials and that it doesn't affect chances of getting a certain job in the future? No, that's a good question. So there definitely are schools that are more um, like specialty based. So there's, I think there's definitely like surgical PA schools. The school I went to was a primary care, PA primary care focus, but I could tell you that 10 to 20, maybe 20% 20 of the students in my class went to primary care. So I do not think it matters. Um, honestly, I don't think it matters at all where you go to school in the PA profession. And I, I can't speak for, for a medical doctor, but for PAs, you pass the board certification exam and they want to hire someone that they like, they get along with, they believe in them, they want to learn, and they have passed and got their certification. So for me, it did not, they, I don't even think they know where I went to school. Like, I don't think anyone cares. That's true. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and so as far as first assisting as the PA, what are you able to do in the surgeries? So that is a really good question and really depends on the provider and the surgeon you're working with. So as far as what we're allowed to do, like we can, I mean, we can do our own minor procedures. So like we can do our own minor INDs and cyst removals and all of that outside of the OR. So, you know, we can make skin incisions, we can cauterize, we can tie off vessels, we're clamping vessels, we're retracting, like we're just basically second hands for the surgeon, um, everything. I mean, we can do everything. We're just helping them being their second hands, knowing what they want next, um, understanding what tools that are used. So. Oh, that's really cool. Uh, thank you. And so uh, another student was wondering, um, what if you're confused about what to decide with a patient? What would you do in that situation? Oh, well, that happens all the time. I mean, um, there's tons of times where you're like, I don't know what to do with this patient. Um, I'm confused about this and this. I always, I mean, when in doubt, I'm like I said, I'm fairly new. So when in doubt, I ask for help. Um, one of my like sponsoring supervising physicians, he always said like, he tells me, he's like, I trust you to, to make a decision. And when you make that decision, I trust that it's a good decision, but I also trust you to ask me for help when you need help. And so that like really stuck with me. So, and I think that goes for anything like a, a, a medical, like a medical student, a resident, like a nursing student, a nurse, like anytime you're working in basically any field is if you don't know, ask. And one of the things that I try to pride myself and work on as a provider is if someone's asking me something that I feel like is a dumb question or a stupid question or something that I'm like frustrated by in the, in the moment, because I'm busy is I was there once too. And I don't ever want to make feel, someone feel like they can't ask me a question and that's going to hurt the patient. So I try to just condense my questions if there's multiple and just say, Hey, and there's times where I like text the surgeon, I'm like, or I call him, I'm like, hey, I really need to talk to you. I don't know what to do with this patient. Um, but most of the time, all the patients are talked about at some point. So we create a, like, we, we come up with something and everyone knows the plan and that can change throughout the day. But um, yeah, always ask for help if you need it. Perfect. Um, and so here is a question that I'm sure that many students are wondering. Um, <laughs> what advice would you give to students who are struggling to figure out if PA or medical school is right for them? Oh, goodness. Uh, <sighs> yeah, I, this is a really hard question. Um, I think the, the best thing to do if you really are in between is to talk to providers. So find as many PAs and as many doctors that you can in multiple different specialties 
and ask them what they like and they don't like about their job. Also shadow as many, I know it's hard right now, but as many of these kind of things, I know people are getting like credit and stuff for this, but it's also like a really good opportunity for people to realize what they like about something and what they don't like and ask the real questions of what they want in their future. Um, I, I knew I wanted to be in medicine, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I think I, I like really liked trauma and surgery, but I also liked orthopedics and I just decided that not knowing was okay. And having the opportunity to work in all those specialties might be something I want to do. And that was what drove me the way it drove me. Um, I wanted to work in surgery. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think part of it is how long do you want to go to school? Mm -hmm. Um, So for example, if you want to be a neurosurgeon, you got to go to college and then to medical school and do something like seven years of post-medical school training. Um, Whereas if you wanted to be a PA physician associate working with a neurosurgeon, it would be substantially less, half that. Uh, and yet you would still be involved with the same cases and so on and so on. Another piece, I think, uh, uh, Brenna, is the uncertainty. For example, uh, as I mentioned a while ago, uh, for our 22 spots in our emergency medicine residency start, that just started uh, this week, we had 1,700 applicants for 22 spots. It was so freaking competitive. And so that gives a measure of uncertainty that says, I'm going to go to school for years and maybe not Mm -hmm. get the residency spot that I want. So if Mm -hmm. you don't want to live with that kind of uncertainty and yet still have a job where you work with patients in all their areas, um, but don't want to go to school that long and maybe not necessarily have to borrow that much money because many people have to borrow a lot of money, then get PA a try or NP, you know, nursing practitioner is also a very reasonable thing to consider as well. Yeah, actually, I never really thought about the, the fact that you may not get into the, the residency that you want. And that's, I mean, that's huge. Um, Yeah, that's a giant, you go and put all this effort in if you have. uh, This weekend working with, sorry to interrupt, but this weekend working with a resident, she said something I thought was really interesting because she knew a gal who had gone to medical school and then done an OBGYN residency and realized, you know, seven years after, uh, me- uh, after starting medical school, she really didn't like what she was doing. So that's a, that's another risk. You know, you may yeah. not like what you, you may not like what you get when you get there. Yeah, no, that's, that's, yeah, you're investing into, I, I know a couple, a handful of people like that. I uh, met an emergency medicine doctor who worked for a couple, like worked for, I don't know, 10, 15 years as emergency medicine, was really burnt out. And he ended up going back to residency and getting a sports medicine, I think it was sports medicine residency. But um, yeah, it's just, it's, yeah, there's a lot to consider. And obviously I'm not a doctor. So a lot of that kind of stuff, I I don't think about anymore because that was four or five years ago for me now. Um, when I was making that decision, but that's a really good point. Um, well, and you know, the other piece is that, and even after you've invested, invested the time, like the example you just gave with the EM doc who went on to sports medicine, you can continue to change. One of my closest friends in our program is a guy who is now 41, four kids married, who did finance like your hub for mm-hmm. years and decided he wanted to do something else. So he went back and went to medical school. So wow. you're, you're not locked into the same thing. And then I'll shut up with this, Brina. There was one of our docs who's just a lovely person, EM doc, who did a disaster medicine fellowship with us Wow! and then went on to do a toxicology fellowship. Imagine that. <laughs> and I said, uh, Nancy, are you, are you ever going to get out of school? You're pushing 50 already. And she, and she said, and I'll, I'll shut up with this, Brina. She said, why would I want to get out of school if I want to continue to learn? And I said, I can't argue with him. <laughs> uh, my argument was you learn every day on the job. There, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Keep going. You yeah, no. Some, you, yeah. Ready for some case, you ready for some cases? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Good stuff, Rena. This is terrific. <laughs> you got 250 of our closest friends listening to every word that you're saying. Oh, goodness. I love it. I'm so, I'm so excited and happy. Like, this is great. This is everything I want. Like 
I want to be able to, you know, pro provide as much information and knowledge about it as I can. So I'm glad everyone is here and hopefully I'm not rambling too much. All right, so the first case we're going to do is a day in the real life of Brina. So you receive a page at 11.30 a.m. This is your page. Yes, I have a pager, like a real pager that I did not know how to work when I first started, but you learn. So consult room, ED room to abdominal pain, Dr. Stone. Okay, so Miss Jones is a 45 year old female with a past medical history of obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. She presents to the emergency room with a one day history of nausea, vomiting, and right upper quadrant abdominal pain and started after eating a McDonald's burger. So this is, I kind of presented this in a, in a way that I kind of go about thinking about it when I hear a consult. So when I see a consult that's a consult like this, the first thing I do is go to the patient's chart and I see, okay, what, what have they, you know, what's the history, what happened, what's the imaging that's been done, what's the labs that's been done, what's their past medical history, what do I need to know before I even go talk to the patient. Um, this helps, I think, create a better background for one, like what kind of a patient as a whole you're looking at. If you go in there blind, you can forget a lot of questions and forget, um, kind of like the, the, the whole picture. So this kind of gives me a bigger picture of what kind of a patient I'm looking at and what I should be, what other things I should be thinking about. So surgical history. So working in surgery, knowing their surgical history, especially in their abdomen is huge. Do not forget to ask this. Um, very important. Allergies, obviously super important. And then medications. Um, this is usually reconciled in their, in their EMR so that I can kind of see like, basically a lot of times people don't really know what they see a doctor for. So going and seeing what meds they're on helps me realize, okay, metformin, like if this patient doesn't know that they have diabetes, like I'm going to know they're taking metformin most likely for diabetes, lisinopril, like they're taking this for blood pressure or for their diabetes. Um, and then social history. So this is something that is drilled into your head in school. And I think you kind of brush over it like, okay, you know, social history, what does this have to do with anything? But I found that social history, especially in the hospital is so important in figuring out, like I was mentioning, and I probably said 7,000 times now is like figuring out a discharge plan, a safe discharge plan for someone is huge, one for hospital readmission, two for their well-being, three for their like their improvement and how they're gonna have access to wound care and medications and all of that. So understanding the social history also helps understand the patient as a whole. So this patient lives alone with three cats, 20 pack year history of tobacco use, sexually active with multiple female partners, no recreational drug use and social alcohol use. Um, I guess if it was a real life patient for me, it would be definitely recreational drug use, but we hope that out on this one. Um, temperature is 99, so not febrile, but a little bit elevated. Blood pressure a little high, 140 over 70. Respiratory rate 18, oxygen saturation 97%. So I just put in a basic lab. So wet blood cell count is elevated. Um, and then you go and examine the patient. So this is all information that generally I have before I see a patient. Not always, but before. usually when someone consults us, they kind of already have an idea of what they want us to see them for. Um, if you don't, that's a sure way to really piss off a surgeon, <laughs> not know why you're consulting them. Um, so you go examine the patient and this is what you find. So you go and do your, your H and T. So you go talk to them and you're, you ask all these questions, which is kind of where you get all this. You find your history, even though the emergency medicine doctor has already asked these questions. I always preface it with, hi, I'm Brina. I know, you know, I'm one of the surgical physician assistants. I know you've answered all these questions already, but I just want to answer them or ask them again, make sure that we have a full and complete story. Usually people don't get mad when you, when you say something like that and you ask them all the questions that 
you probably already know, but you want to know for yourself and you want to ask them because sometimes things can change. Um, they feel more comfortable talking to one provider versus the other. Um, they remember different things. They're in a lot of pain. Things are changing. So I think it's really important to get the information for yourself, even if you know the answer based on what someone has told you. So physical exam. General, they're not in any acute distress, but they're visibly uncomfortable. Cardio, regular rate and rhythm, pulmonary, clear to auscultation bilaterally, though exam limited by habitus. Um, abdominal exam, their right upper quadrant tenderness. They have a positive Murphy sign. They're non-distended, soft with active bowel sounds. So um, right upper quadrant tenderness, a positive Murphy sign is basically pressing on the right upper quadrant um, underneath the rib cage and patient takes a big deep breath in and they basically like wince when they uh, take that breath out. So extremities lying in the hospital, lying in the ED bed on the left side due to right side abdominal pain and their skin is anectric. So basically like normal skin color. Um, I have seen um, people also write like normal skin color for race. Um, that's another good one to put in there. Um, but anectrix is, is specifically important for like surgical, especially with what we think is going on here. Okay, so at this point, what imaging study would you hope the ED doc has ordered? And if not, what will you ask him or her to order to confirm your suspicion? So you guys can put it out in the comments and then Cheyenne will just shoot out a couple at me. So it looks like one of the first answers we got was uh, Lourdes says gallstones, uh, ultrasound imaging recommended. Uh, most people are saying ultrasound, um, CT if that is negative. Uh, yeah, those are pretty much most of the answers there. Love it. All right, I agree. So gallbladder ultrasound. Um, this is a classic acute cholecystitis presentation. Um, many of the ED docs will mass order abdominal CT scans to check for everything. And this often overexposes patients to unnecessary radiation. So um, that sounds a little aggressive, but obviously the ED is pumping out patients and there's a ton of them and they don't know what's going on um, right away. So a CT scan is like a broad picture of everything. So that's really helpful. Um, if the patient is having a lot of diffuse, non-specific signs. Um, this patient, I would say, is pretty classic for acute cholecystitis. So I would probably order a gallbladder ultrasound first before um, exposing this patient to more radiation in a whole entire abdominal CT scan. Obviously, if there's a lot more going on, they're tachycardic, they're febrile, and you know this patient is going septic, then a CT scan would be kind of a good way to broad Broad spectrum, like what's going on? What are we? What are we missing here? Brianna, um, we, call this, we call this the patient read the textbook. <laughs> yes, exactly. The patient read the textbook here. So um, yes, so they don't always read the textbook. Sometimes they read the textbook. But um, interestingly enough, I feel like this is a very easy classic presentation of acute cholecystitis that will be hammered into your head throughout schooling. But there are this specifically, for whatever reason, I think is a very, very tough, the gallbladder is very complicated and tough, and I think it's oversimplified in training. So um, there's so many different variations of what could be going wrong that could lead to acute cholecystitis, cholecystitis, um, elevated liver function tests that are unrelated, just there's so many things that make this a really complicated uh, organ. And so I feel like knowing the basics and understanding the basics first will help build on that for sure. So yes, this patient read the textbook. Um, so the gallbladder ultrasound shows again, another classic finding of acute cholecystitis. So pericholecystic fluid and gall gallbladder wall thickening, uh, sonographic Murphy sign. So that basically just means when the sonographer put the uh, introducer into their right upper quadrant and press down and they took a deep breath, it caused them a lot of pain. Okay, so you make the, the patient NPO. So basically they can't eat anything. So this patient is, um, say they, I don't remember what time I said they came in. So they came in in the morning, they ate, say they ate breakfast. So 
you're going to make the patient from that point on NPO. So if they ate breakfast at 8 a.m., you could probably put the case on for 4 or 5 p.m. Um, depending on how sick they are, you could probably wait to the next day and be fine giving them IV antibiotics. So you make this patient MPO as soon as you see them. Like one of the first things I do after I see them, I'm like, okay, they need to go to surgery today. Order, do not eat anything. Um, you touch base with the surgeon. So this, like I said, this case is pretty classic. I would feel confident just basically putting this person on the schedule. Um, but you always kind of just say, hey, you know, there's a gallbladder in the ED. Um, they'll look over the chart and they'll say, yeah, go for it. Um, so then you write the H and P note to admit the patient into the hospital. So history and physical, we write the admit orders. I write the admit note, and then I do what's called a prep for case. So that's basically just a bunch of orders that tell the operating room that this patient is coming to the operating room and they need to be put on the uh, urgent case list that will be added. Um, so this one, the lap fully gets added on for 2 p.m. So here I try to find like a decent picture that kind of talks about and shows the laparoscopic cholecystectomy like surgical approach. Um, one thing you, you learn in surgery is that every surgeon does something a little bit differently and they do it how they're trained. And so each port is a little bit different based on where the surgeon trained or um, what they're comfortable with. But I would say this is, this approach is my favorite approach to work with someone who does it is the most efficient and uh, based on the people I work with. So generally I'm standing over, oh, I guess you can't really see my screen, but, or see my mouse, but, um, so I'm generally standing over here. If you can see where the surgical tools are on the two surgical tools, and then, um, the surgeon is standing on the other side with the laparoscope and the other surgical set of tools, but that changes depend on which surgeon I'm working with and what approach they're doing. Um, Usually we're manipulating the gallbladder in a case and sometimes the surgeon's holding the camera and working with some other tools. Sometimes I'm holding the camera and holding a tool. It really just depends on the case. So this is generally the approach. Generally there's four port sites. They're really little five to 12 millimeter ports. Um, depending on how sick the gallbladder is, the case can take anywhere from 45 minutes, 30 minutes to a couple hours. Um, I would say on average, these acute cholecystitis patients probably take about two, two hours. Brenda, Brenda we, uh, here in Texas, we have a vast amount of biliary tract disease. Uh, it is a genetic thing, especially in mm -hmm. our Latin population. Mm -hmm. So we see all kinds of manifestations of uh, gallbladder, biliary tract, so forth down here. Yeah, it's like I was mentioning, it just, I feel like it was something that I didn't realize how complicated it could be until I really got involved in it with, with surgery. And there's so many times that I've had to ask the surgeon, I'm like, why aren't we taking this patient to surgery? Or why are we doing all these tests? Like, it seems like it would be pretty classic, but it's not. And so there's a lot of different variations that uh, you think it's simple, but you have to think outside the box. You said something very interesting while I go about reaching for the ultrasound first. Part of that was the fact that you'd like not to submit the patient to an enormous amount of radiation. I read once two or three years ago in JAMA that um, two CTs, two CAT scans of the abdomen give as much radiation to the body as if you'd stood one mile from ground zero at Hiroshima. We, Wow. That's number one. Number two is, and actually ultrasound is your better test because you can mm -hmm. actually see the gallbladder and the pericholecystic fluid and so forth. You can see that better on ultrasound rather than CT. Absolutely. Yeah. I, uh, I love when the ED docs order ultrasound. It also makes it a little easier. I'm still, I'm still not, I mean, I've gotten better with reading CTs, but I'm still not a pro at it. So I, I've been trying. But yeah, don't feel, the don't feel like the don't feel like the Lone Ranger. I stare at CTs all the time, <laughs> head, 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 chest, belly, pelvis, and you know I I just I'm humbled by what I don't know after all these years. 
Yeah. I mean, one of my, I would say one of my people I call the absolute most in our hospital is the radiologist. Absolutely. Uh, like I, he, we have an intervent interventional radiologist who does a lot of our drainage or abscess drainage, but he's awesome. And he, I call him all the time. I'm like, Hey, what, what, what imaging should I order for this case? You know, there's a lot of different imaging resources that I, I guess I didn't even know what would be the best case for certain things. And so, especially with like coli uh, tubes and just some weird drainage stuff. So yeah, their radiology is a great yeah. resource. A hundred years ago this year, 1921, Zachary Cope uh, from a very famous uh, English surgeon wrote, never rise from the bed, meaning when we would sit on the bed and examine our patients without completing a differential diagnosis, you know, because they didn't have any tests. You had to figure mm -hmm. it out before you cut. Yeah. Today, today it's sort of a half-ass history, a half-ass physical, send the patient over to radiology and let the CT, let the radiologist with a CT tell you what's wrong with your patient. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of sad, you know, in a way. Yeah, no, the physical exam. I mean, I, I sound, I feel like I sound like my teachers that I was, I was, uh, you know, rolling my eyes at back in school, but the, the physical exam is so important on a patient and literally laying your eyes on them. Like there's nothing that like nothing more valuable, I think, than laying your eyes and hands on a patient to really figure out what's going on. Hey, Brina, uh, we had a good question. How do you ensure the patient won't vomit during surgery with cases, you know, somebody, you know, they're having cholecystitis, but they've got a full stomach. Uh, you want to comment on that one? So like I said, like kind of I had briefly, I guess, alluded to is so in emergency cases, you're not having the patient prep for surgery all night by not eating. But I think that we usually anesthesia is okay with about um, like six hours after their last meal. So in cases like this are we try to wait till that six hour mark. Generally, patients aren't sick enough that it's like, oh, we got to run them to surgery right now and we can wait until that six hour mark. We use lots of, lots of antiemetics. Um, and then our anesthesia team uses like a scopolamine patch, which also helps with nausea and vomiting. Uh, but anesthesia really does a lot of the managing of that during like the perioperative phase. And, and securing the airway as soon as possible during surgery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, the, on the traumas where somebody was on the way home from a restaurant with a full stomach and a couple of drinks in there, uh, but you still got to take them to the OR. Sometimes, sometimes you can't control all that. You have to be very, very careful in the operating. Absolutely. Absolutely. Please, please go ahead. Um, uh, okay. So we took the person to the OR. They had an uneventful lap coli and they make it back to the floor by 5 PM. The case is pretty quick. And then I would say, most of the time, if these patients do not have like a perforated um, gallbladder or they don't have pus or bile spilling into their abdomen, they can usually leave in the next day. So many of these patients discharge the following day after surgery. And then every single patient we do surgery on, and even some patients that we don't do surgery on that we just consult on, we see within one to two weeks at the very most or the very minimum, very minimum. Okay, so the next case will be kind of a trauma case. So this is the last one, you guys, don't worry. Um, so you get this page and hear the announcement overhead at 9 a.m. So like I mentioned during my schedule, so think about I'm doing rounding at this time. I could be in a surgical case at this time. I could be in clinic at this time. So full trauma, ED room one, ETA 10 minutes. So in if I am doing anything except for in the middle of an OR case, I drop what I'm doing and I go to the emergency room. So stop whatever you're doing unless you're in the OR and straight, head straight to the ED. Glown up, glove up, mask up. Um, now with COVID, it was required N95. I don't think it's required an N95 anymore. I wear an N95, uh, but you should always wear a mask, glasses, gown, gloves, everything to protect, protect yourself and the patient. And then you get in the room and get prepared for patient arrival. So um, 
a lot of times you'll have a little bit of a predisposition of what's happening. They'll know, you know, somebody, the nurse will, or the charge nurse or, will know, okay, this patient had a fall from height or this patient was in an MVC. So they were in a car accident, but sometimes you're getting there right as the patient's wheeling in and you have no idea of the history of what's happening. So it's very variable depending on how much time you have and when you're getting to the, to the ED. So um, this is a patient arrives by stretcher by the EMS and they are wheeling the patient in the room. EMS gives you this report. So um, there's a 55 year old male who fell off of a ladder about 15 feet. He landed on his left side. Initial loss of consciousness without known duration, uh, C collar in place and his GCS score is 15 upon EMS arrival, blood pressure and vitals stable and root. He has two large bore and a cubital fossa IVs. So that's a lot of words, but basically the patient is um, fully responsive. He's oriented. He's able to move his, his arms and legs and a C collar was placed. So a, a cervical spine immobilizer was placed by the emergency, med emergency medical crew. And um, the two large bore IVs are in his elbow pit. So this is kind of a pretty classic hope that pre-hospital has kind of done all of this stuff, but it doesn't always happen. I mean, I can't tell you the amount of times that we patients have come in without IVs just because they weren't able to get them. They're hypovolemic. They just, there's, and you just got to deal with it and go with what you have. So I put the GCS scale. So the Glasgow coma scale. So this is a pretty important um, tool. It's something that it gets burned in your head over and over again, but it's something that for some reason it's hard. It's, it's always hard to, for me at least to remember. So I always am re-looking at it and um, re-remembering re these numbers. So very important to know what each level is and then um, the, be able to calculate it quickly on a patient. So 15 is the best score, three is la uh, the lowest score. And I was always told GCS less than eight, you intubate. So basically someone who's not oriented enough to manage their own airway, you want to intubate them. That's a broad spectrum kind of overview. Um, what's the first thing that you do? So um, if this patient is coming in, wheeling in, the EMS is giving you the kind of little rundown. At the same time, you're like listening with one ear and there's a lot of other people listening. And so what is the first thing that you want to do to this patient? So first thing we wanna do is talk to the patient. So trauma is all about an algorithm. So ABCs are the trauma algorithms and most important things, no matter what the problem or what the person is coming in for, ABCs always. Um, so A is airway. So if someone's able to talk to you and they're able to answer questions, then their airway is intact. So even if they're like, I'm having a hard time breathing, you know, if they're talking, then their airway is intact. So next thing you want to do is listen to breath sounds. So put your stethoscope over their lungs, listen. At that point, you know, it is, I would say this is one of the most difficult things to do in a trauma. There's so many people in the trauma room. You're having a, you know, you have your stethoscope on. There's so much going on. You're trying to listen for breath sounds. This patient is screaming because they're in pain. Um, but so important. So just look, listening for breath sounds, if you can hear something, um, or if you're like, oh, I, I don't know, that kind of feels a little muffled. I, they're, they're breathing. They're okay. They're, they're, they're sta their vitals are stable, but that sounds a little concerning. And the first thing, you know, I'm holding their wrist at the same time, getting their pulse. I'm saying, hey, can we get x-ray in here? You know, I need a chest x-ray. Something doesn't, you know, sound right. Um, the other thing you can also have, if you're having a difficult time listening is have someone else listen. There's a bunch of other people in the room. And if you're just either nervous or you're, you're just unable to hear, then say, hey, can you hear breath sounds? So this is all happening quick within 10 to 15 seconds. Sometimes this happens before the patient even gets moved to the hospital bed. So this is happening like in transition or on the stretcher um, done really quick. So ABC is done just like that. 
A uh, fun little fact, if you can feel a patient's pulse, radial pulse, then their systolic blood pressure is greater than 90. So before you even have like any sort of monitors on them, that if you're feeling their pulse, you're like, okay, we already know that they got some sort of blood pressure. Okay. And then D and E, so A, B, C, D, E, kind of the trauma motto, disability. So again, you're running over the GCS score. You're kind of having them do a brief neuro exam based on kind of like what the problems are. If, if you're, and then the other thing with trauma is you can't go from A to B to C if you haven't done or if something's not okay with A. So if this person is got a, you can't feel a pulse, like you're not going on to do their GCS and brief neuro score unless you have a pulse. So, um, and then, and a lot of times in reality, this is kind of all happening at once. So exposure. So at this same time, you're doing all that. Someone's cutting off their clothes. Um, putting warm blankets on them. Sometimes there's a bear hugger, which is basically like a, a air filled, I don't know, pocket that goes underneath the patient that keeps warm, keeps them warm. Um, keeping the patient warm is one of the most important things in traumas. Um, so that often gets overlooked, but there's plenty of people outside the room that can go run and get you some blankets. Okay, so this patient's vitals are stable. He is talking, knows his name, has normal pulses, normal breath sounds. He reports that he was working on his roof, slipped and fell, landing on his left shoulder. He has left shoulder pain and vague abdominal pain. Uh, you do a quick full body assessment and notice a superficial abrasion to the left forehead with swelling and visible left shoulder deformity. He has a palpable radial pulse on the left upper extremity, left-sided pelvic tenderness elicited. Negative fast exam done by the ED doc. Sorry, let me plug in my computer really quick. It looked like it was gonna die on me. There we go. Okay, so we roll, we roll the patient and do a quick spine assessment and skip the rectal exam. So um, you're doing, so at this, pain, at this point, you've gone through A, B, C, D, E, the patient is stable, and now you're doing kind of a secondary assessment. So you're going over everything, you're looking in their eyes, their ears, their face, their shoulder, their chest, everything. You always, always, always roll the patient, palpate the spine. Um, you never want to miss something on the back. And then in this case, the patient's moved his hands, legs, talking to you and everything. So we're going to uh, spare the patient and skip the rectal exam. Um, I think some people would say not to do that, but in reality, it happens a lot. Okay, so... You order a quick chest x-ray and left shoulder x-ray to be completed in the trauma bay. So you have a mobile little x-ray machine comes in. Those are pretty easy to do. Um, in this case, since I had a little bit of pelvic pain, I would have also done a um, kind of like a pelvic abdominal x-ray. And then uh, the patient is stable enough for CT. So we roll them down to the CT scanner. Um, because he had fallen and hit his head, we're going to do a head CT and we're also going to pan scan him, which is basically or a pan scan him from the head to the pelvis. So um, pan scanning is kind of like a loose term that we use in trauma and in ED is just kind of like scan everything of, of importance. So the head, the chest and the pelvis and the abdomen. So we do the head CT in addition to this, even though he's got a normal GCS. Um, this patient fell, hit his head and lost consciousness for an unknown duration of time. So we felt that it was important to see if there's any sort of um, intracranial bleeding, which could be presented a little bit later on. Um, we do have the shoulder x-ray that shows a displaced humeral head fracture and the chest CT and chest x-ray show left fifth through seventh rib fractures. So this is just a picture that I got off the internet. It's not indicative of this specific case, but you can kind of see on this, the fractures of the rib cage. Okay, so, at, ooh, okay, so the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna call ortho and say, we have this displaced humeral head fracture and we're gonna let them work their magic. So they're gonna decide if this patient needs to go to surgery right away. Um, they're going to decide if, oh, no, they're fine. Put them in a sling. We'll see them tomorrow, which is usually the case. Um, and then they get admitted to the trauma service. So they get admitted to our service, which is the trauma acute care surgery service. Um, 
And then one other important thing that I want to ask you guys is what do you think needs to be done within the first 24 hours of admitting this patient to the trauma service? I'm gonna chime in first, uh, Brenna, which mm -hmm. is that patients change. And uh, they, may, they may look one way one time, but they change. And I'll, I'll just sort of start with that. <laughs> I'm giving you a hint. All right, shoot good, me with, shoot me got with some, your got answers. Some good feedback here. Got some good feedback here with changes in level of consciousness, continue checking the airway, breathing, and circulation through monitoring the patient very closely. All, all good answers. I like it. It's all essentially what needs to happen next, all aspects of what needs to happen next. So um, definitely while the patient's in the emergency room and when they're on the floor, you're doing neuro checks, you're doing, um, you know, you're, you're having the nurses check on them all the time. So the one thing that answer I was specifically asking for is a tertiary trauma assessment. And Dr. Fowler was alluding to that is patients change all the time. So I have a really good example of something that happened. Um, basically, the tertiary trauma assessment is a head to toe assessment of every single thing you learn in med school and PA school and nursing school and every exam you've ever done in your life, you're going to do it on this patient. So you're going to basically make sure that there is nothing you missed in trauma. So in trauma, they have, there's patients that can have a lot of just like a distracting injury. So for this case, this patient had a shoulder dislocation and fracture. So that's a distracting injury. That's going to hurt like heck, you know? And so they may not notice this other wrist fracture on their right side or this other thing that's going on or this huge laceration that, you know, we were all focused on something else and didn't see it. So um, tertiary trauma assessment is head to toe exam of everything that you could ever think of doing. Um, so an example of this is we had a patient who came in for a fracture, a big fracture of some sort and um, was taken to the OR basically, I think it was maybe that night or, or the day after by ortho and they were doing great. They were working with physical therapy the next day and they kept saying, oh, the, you know, my ankle hurts, my ankle hurts and PT and everyone was just like, oh, you know, you, you know, you're walking on it funny. You only have, you're only weight bearing on one leg, whatever it is. And so I go and ortho says, okay, this patient's ready for discharge. We're the primary service, but ortho is consulting on them. And I said, okay, like, is there any specific orders or anything you want me to do? When should the patient follow up with you? Gave me all that stuff. And I go in and talk to patients like my ankle's really hurting. So I do my physical exam and I look at his ankle and it's swollen and huge. And I said, you know what, let's just get an x-ray on this ankle. Um, I didn't see any imaging done on it earlier. Let's check it out. And sure enough, he had an ankle fracture that was completely undiagnosed because he had a completely other distracting injury that um, was causing him way more pain at the time. So um, it's really important to get those other physical exams, get those other imaging if you need it. Don't be afraid to reassess the patient over again and ask for help or ask questions. So um, yeah, this patient had another fracture that we just needed to manage and it didn't prevent or change anything, but I had to recall ortho <laughs> and say, hey, actually, could you look at this other fracture on the same person? Um, so yeah, super, super important. Um, and a lot of things can be missed if we don't do it. Hey, uh, Brenna, um, go back one slide to the chest x-ray. Mm -hmm. um, so where the, where the arrows are, everybody, you, you can see where the ribs are actually fractured there. What is not obvious is that there's an artery that runs under each rib. And when you break a rib like that, those arteries often rupture, they tear, and they bleed into the lung cavity. And so this is the thing about patients change. The term is called hemothorax or hemoneumothorax. And so this patient could actually theoretically get close to bleeding to death um, because just because of the rib fractures. So that's just an example of the kind of thing that Brenna and her team uh, have to keep an eye on to watch for patients that may change due to internal hemorrhage. Yeah, absolutely. So rib fractures are extremely, extremely common. Um, and a lot of times you do see 
a hemo or pneumothorax when the patient presents, I would say majority of the time or not majority, but a lot of the time it's just a solidary like rib fracture, but there are a lot of times that patients present with a pneumothorax and rib fractures or hemothorax and rib, rib fractures. But like Dr. Fowler said is we're monitoring this patient and we're making sure we're checking labs and making sure that they're stable so that we are noticing, oh, are they more short of breath? Well, why are they more short of breath? Are they just in pain or are they more short of breath because they have blood filling in their lungs? So, um, yeah, lots of really important things. I, I, uh, like to, I like to say that patients tell you a lot about themselves if you just pay attention. For example, how do you tell chronic alcoholism from a chest x-ray? And the answer is multiple old healed rib fractures <laughs> because they get drunk and they fall down and they break their ribs. And they don't know. Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, keep going this is good stuff. um so this yes, uh this is kind of the plan portion of it so i talked about we call ortho we get them on board um if there's any i kind of so this patient's really stable but if there's any consults that i feel like i don't know what they're going to want to do like is this an emergent thing for them or fairly emergent are they going to want to take them to the or tonight i try to get that consult in and call that provider early on in the process so that they can say, okay, let me take a look at the image. Oh no, they're fine. Send them to the floor, make them NPO at midnight. I'll go see them tomorrow. Or they'll say, oh no, let's get them on the OR schedule. Like this is bad. Let's go. So I, I make that call early on in the process so that we kind of have an idea of what they're thinking too. So, um, I mean, the best part about, not the best part, there's a lot of good parts of medicine, but a lot of great parts about medicine is you have a lot of really good people that know what they're doing in their specialty. So ask them their opinion um, because they're really good at what they do. So as far as the rib fractures, we admit the patient, we are managing their rib fractures. So we treat them with what's called aggressive pulmonary toilet is I guess the old term or um, pulmonary it's hygiene. Good, it's, it's a good term. <laughs> Basically, it just means that we need to use what's called an incentive spirometer. So basically get them to use their lungs as much as they can. The hardest thing about rib fractures is they're in a lot of pain. With a lot of fractures, you right ankle fracture or femur fracture, you don't put weight on it. So it doesn't hurt. You can't do that with a rib fracture. And that's what I always tell my patients is this is going to hurt like heck for the next four to six weeks, but you have to use your lungs. So whether that's yoga breathing, whether that's big, deep breaths, whether that's the incentive spirometer, which is basically a tool that you has a little mark that goes up and down when you suck in. I also give them what's called a pep flutter device. So they blow out. Um, I basically try to give them as many tools as they can to um, try to use their lungs. And then the multimodal pain control is basically a pain regimen that we use to try to decrease the amount of narcotics used. So this includes uh, like a nerve pain medication, something like gabapentin. Um, this includes like a muscle relaxer, a lidocaine patch, um, NSAID gel, Tylenol, Ketorolac, if we can use it, or another form of an NSAID if they're not, um, like if their H&H &H isn't super low, if they're not on something that would contradict that. Um, and then obviously some sort of narcotic pain medication, whether that's giving them a PCA where they can push the button and give themselves medication, whether that's scheduled. Um, and then the other thing that I didn't realize was so heavily used until working in my field is basically like an epidural. So having anesthesia place an epidural to help with the pain control to allow for better um, inspiratory and expiratory effort. And I have a pretty low threshold for asking anesthesia to do that, especially with the older patients. Um, you know, a lot of we times. had a good question. We had a good question about why in the world would broken ribs cause pneumonia? And the answer, of course, is that the lung is a sponge and you and, and it has secretions down in it, little bitty secretions. And uh, the, the secretions are coughed out. But if it hurts so much to expand and then cough your cough stuff out of your lung, bacteria get into those secretions and pneumonia develops. Absolutely. And I kind of think about it as like a balloon. So when that balloon, when you're not blowing out into that balloon, it's just kind of sitting kind of like all wrinkled up like that. So the wrinkled up balloon 
can get stuff that sits at the bottom of it. So infection, fluid, um, and then it doesn't, it has a lot harder time to expand. So um, by giving that good breath in and out, you're able to utilize that balloon. And then you could add an additional point to that, Brenna, as I know you know, that which is that when you break a bunch of ribs like that, the lung under it gets bruised. The word is contusion or pulmonary mm -hmm. contusion. And that also causes bad function of the lung on that side. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, rib fractures are no fun. And um, I really feel for patients because it's a long road and it's a difficult road because it's, it's, it's painful no matter what. And then to follow up on that, rib fractures, we don't put a cast on them. They just have to get well. <laughs> exactly. You know, so bracing them is a no-no. Yeah. We, in the old days, when I, when I was even younger than you, we used to tape, the, the, we'd put tape over the chest wall to keep it from moving. And then we came later, we realized we were causing pneumonia by doing that because the lung couldn't expand. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually got asked that question the other day by um, one of the nurses is, why don't we just brace them? Um, and that's the exact reason is we, like I said, you can't brace that area because you're not able to expand and utilize that lung and then you're just causing more problems. So um, really it is, it's kind of a optimized pain management. And it's one of those things that um, I really try to make sure that I optimize their pain control specifically because it matters a lot and it's really important to their recovery. We're just about to publish a study comparing the use of non-narcotics like the NSAIDs, like ibuprofen and so on, versus, um, versus uh, narcotics for pain control due to fractures on patients that were discharged from the emergency department. We hmm. found, interestingly, that at the first post-op visit or at the first post-ER visit, that the level of pain was identical, whether we use narcotics or uh, ibuprofen basically. And we, we, and yet we found that over 90% of what was prescribed were narcotics. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, there's, I mean, that's, I think that's where this kind of multimodal pain control kind of, uh, aroused from is just kind of like the fact that we, we have swung the pendulum in direct in two different directions so quickly from the, the non prescribing narcotics to the over prescribing of narcotics. And, and there's definitely, I think, a time and place for them, but a lot of prescribers and patients do not utilize the ibuprofen and Tylenol to its fullest potential. Um, and I try to educate patients on making sure that um, if they're able based on their, their history to take those medications appropriately, that they can get a lot more out of them than what they do over the counter. So that's a lot of that is just educating um, providers and patients. Um, so someone of this caliper, I would say um, they did not require uh, epidural. They did okay on oral pain medications. We discharged them on multimodal pain control and they were able to leave the hospital in three to four days. Um, I usually see them back, like I said, in two weeks and um, people are generally doing okay still in a lot of pain, but able to manage and slowly wean off a lot of, if we do prescribe them narcotics, they're able to be either no longer using them anymore or significantly like only using them at bedtime or whatever the case. All right, so that's the last of that case. Um, that's all the cases I have for tonight. Um, I just wanted to kind of give you guys a little bit of overview and some resources for, um, just some stuff I do in, in surgery. So uh, surgery resources and stuff I find super helpful that people may not know about and you may know about, but hopefully it's helpful. Surgery Recall is a book. It is like, I would say if you're a med student, PA student, anything, it is your guide to surgery. It's very basic. It's easily laid out pictures. It talks about lots of surgical instruments. It talks about just very commonly seen surgical acute care in general cases, the, the approaches to those cases, super, super helpful. If I were to like recommend any book for like a general surgery, kind of prepare yourself, it would be that. Um, obviously before any sort of surgical rotation or getting into surgery, knowing your anatomy is super important. Um, 
I've taken anatomy so many times. I was a kinesiology major, um, but I still feel like I learn new anatomy every day. So always good to review. Another thing, get yourself some compression stockings. Love these things for if you're standing all day or walking around or like being in surgery. They're very helpful. Get them on Amazon. They're not bad. Get yourself a couple and have them for your like residencies or your rotations. And um, something I really stress is just knowing your glove size. So I, I don't imagine this is much of a as much of a problem with like med students, but MPA school, we're we're like rushed through a lot of stuff really quickly. And stuff like this kind of gets looked over. Like we don't really, if you've never worked in a situation where you're working using sterile gloves, you have no idea what your sterile glove size is. So um, definitely, definitely know your glove size. And also I always, always, always tell people to double glove. A lot of surgeons, a lot of scrub techs do not do it, but protect yourself and protect the patient and double glove. This not only I do an indicator glove. So basically that's like a blue glove and then a white glove. So that helps me if I get a cut in my top glove, the blue pops out and I can see right away. And the scrub tech will be like, nope, you're out, go get a new glove. Um, it's honestly, it's something easy you can do. It does not hurt anyone if you do it, but it can hurt people if you don't do it. So always recommend that. And then have fun. So surgery specifically can be really intimidating, especially for PA students or nursing students or even med students who've never been in the OR. It can be really intimidating working with surgeons um, or people that have been doing it a long time because sometimes they don't realize what they know. So scrub techs are a really good resource um, or surgical technicians. They are, they, they own the OR. They're really good about knowing where everything is and where people are and the rules. And if you have any questions, ask them, like they want you to, they want you to succeed. They don't want you to screw up their sterile failed. So ask them if you have any questions about anything. Um, Cause they're, they're always helpful. And sometimes they can be intimidating, but it's better to ask than to just do something. Don't take anything off of their trays without asking. Are you getting yelled at? Okay. Um, and I guess this is, is pretty much the end. So like I said, you guys can reach out to me on Instagram, my stuff's on the first or email my stuff's on the first slide. Um, please ask me any questions about anything, whether it's PA school, um, relationships, finding a job, all that jazz, I'm happy to answer it. Um, I'm here for you guys. I have fun doing this. And I like to hear myself talk. So it works out. Um, that's a joke. I'm kidding. Um, okay, so here I am. If you need me, um, I'll happy to answer any last minute questions that you guys have. But yeah, thank you so much for having me, Dr. Fowler and the team. Like it was so lovely. So, um, yeah, so, so fun. Sabrina, um, all things considered, would you do it again? Do what again? The shadowing or PA school? <laughs> uh, PA school, <laughs> this job, you like what you're doing, you're happy with it? Yeah, so absolutely. I. Um, I, I do sometimes have that, what would it, what would it be like if I went to med school, but I am very, very happy with what I do. I love trauma. I love acute care surgery. I love that I'm learning something new every day. I love and know that I'm someone that's constantly on the move. And I have a feeling that eventually I'm going to want to try something else. And I love that that position as a PA allows me to do it. So I have no regrets. Um, I love that my schedule allows me to see my husband and travel and go on trips and hike and still work out and do all the things I love. So yeah, love it. And yes, I would absolutely come back and talk to you guys again, if you would have me. <laughs> any, um, uh, any, um, regrets about not going on to med school or are you doing what you want to do? I am doing what I want to do. I, I, I think that a lot of times right after, I, I would say for me, there was a time where I was like, did I pick the right way? Like, I, yeah, did I pick the right thing? But now working in a field I've worked in and being a PA for about a year now, I feel very happy with what I'm doing and very confident that this is the perfect job for me. You know, it's, it's said that most people don't plan their lives from start to finish. Uh, it has been said, I heard it, re I read once that the only person who ever planned his life from beginning to end was Dwight Eisenhower. 
past president and there's a whole story about that but uh, you know every all the rest of us things kind of happen they kind of occur we 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 try things for a while we like it we don't like it i absolutely did not plan emergency medicine i backed into it after a period of time in surgery which i just didn't enjoy mm -hmm. and fortunately 40 plus years later i found something i thoroughly enjoy doing i worked all weekend in a busy er with a lot of terrific people and a lot of sick patients who really needed me you know Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm doing what I want to do, but you know, the, 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 such a critical point to all the students still listening, the over 200 still here is that, um, you've got to make your grades now so you can give yourself the power to be able to choose what you want to do. Absolutely. It, and yeah, I think you said it, you said it perfect. Like you're, you don't plan. I think a lot, and something that I, I know that I did when I was younger was, I was so worried about getting to the next step. And I was so worried about, oh, I need to be there. I need to be in PA school. I need to be a PA. I need to do this. But there's so many things that you learn along the way that make you better. And there's so many things I learned along the way that make me a better provider. And sometimes you just need to slow down and enjoy the journey and enjoy the moment because that, that moment's never going to come back again. So yeah. like, that's Alex a one-time is... chance. Yeah, Alex has asked us, can we deconstruct some of the myths about the fears of med school and PA school? And I'll go first. Um, there's a thing called imposter syndrome where you're sort of, a, sort of afraid that you won't ever be quite good enough. I want to assure everybody listening, and, and Brenna, I dare say that you would agree that if you will study everything you don't know that you come across, you're going to be just fine. You're going to be fine. I would also add, if you really think that you can't stand being around vomit, stool, and blood, <laughs> be assured, you'll get over it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, any myths any, any myths from your end, Brenna? Yeah, I think that, um, I think imposter syndrome is tough. I think I've, I've definitely struggled with it myself. And I think as a PA, maybe you feel it a little bit more because you don't have that kind of cushion of residency where I kind of feel like I'm in residency right now. So I feel like I'm, I'm basically constantly learning and having a little bit of help from somebody, but I don't really feel like I ever will know everything. And I think being okay with not feeling like, you know, everything is the most important thing in medicine and knowing that you will never know any, everything and someone else is going to know that little bit more. So don't be afraid to ask for help or ask for someone just, what do you think in this situation? Um, yeah, some people don't want to have that conversation. And yeah, some people will push you off. But I, I, I would encourage you to ask no matter what. Yeah, I am so humble about what I don't know. It took me a long time to get there because I grew up with my father's ego. But I will tell you that, that the more you reach out and ask questions to folks, intelligent questions, you know, uh, uh, after you've really thought about things and looked it up yourself, the more you learn and the more it makes you as someone who's very approachable. So I strongly encourage. Brenna, we've taken almost two hours of your time and you are just wonderful. What a great talk this was. Everybody say thank you, Brenna, and put it in chat right now for her so she can see you all say thank you. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> look at them popping in, 100 of them, 200 of them. Uh, Brenna, uh, uh, we're, we're going to move on to the next slide in a moment, but I do want to yeah. say this. Uh, typically, we'll have about 5,000 people view these talks. Each one of them will go on to be a healthcare professional and probably see 100,000 patients in a career. 5,000 times 100,000 is a half a billion. Tonight, Brenda, you've touched a half a billion lives in the future. So thank you so uh, much. What a great oh talk. Oh, my goodness. It's just, just wonderful. Um, and um, let's see. Now, Cheyenne, you've uh, got some words for us about the uh, exam tonight. Yes? Yes, I do. And it should be on the next slide. If we can see that, please. Um, hold on. Oh, there we go. Okay. There you go. 
So uh, this is the information for assessment number 59 for this session. Uh, it's going to be due next Tuesday, July 13th at 6.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, and just make sure that you download your certificates afterwards directly from that web page. Um, you can find the link to this assessment in the email um, that follows this session tonight. Um, and this is, of course, the QR code that will take you there as well. So if you have your phone available, you can go, go ahead and do that. Um, and yeah, that is everything you need to know about the assessment. Brenna, you'll find this kind of funny. We, um, uh, I'm on the admissions committee and I volunteered a friend of mine and we put the word out through virtual shadowing. Uh, who wants to uh, uh, do a practice interview for medical school <clears throat> with me or with one of my buddies is on the admissions committee. So we, we had a competition. We had 500 mm. people enroll for four spots. Oh and so we will be doing those this month. Be rest assured, everybody who's out there, the four who, who got them. Oh my so, gosh. Isn't that something? So that's Brenna, amazing. Yeah, is that cool? Well, Brenda, thank you so much. What a great session. Everybody, we're going to be here uh, next week and the week after that. If you keep coming, we're going to be here. And so, on behalf of the whole working group uh, who has worked so hard to put this together, uh, Cheyenne, especially, thank you for working with Brenda tonight to, put, to make this work. Brenda, thank Absolutely. you so much for your time and for your grace and for just sharing your time with us. So, um, all right, everybody, it's getting late. So on behalf of the whole working group and for Brenda, we just thank you for coming. We wish you a yes, good evening. Thank you. And a good night. Goodbye. Thank you. All right.